I'm going to reuse the slides because it was so last minute, I don't have time to change the slide. So I gave this talk first uh, in September last year during the Singapore PHP Community Combined Meetup last year. That's how in conjunction with the conference. So uh, the talk is about how to be kind to others. Actually not. Uh. Okay, the actual talk title is Designing Developer-Friendly JSON for API Responses. So this is not uh, what you call per se uh, PHP focus talk. It's more about best practices. Okay, or uh, what I deem as best best practices. La. Okay. Uh, so I've not rehearsed the last time I gave this talk was uh, last year. La, so please bear with me if I made mistakes. Okay, so a bit about myself. My name is Zion. I'm a Singaporean and I finished my national service obligations altogether already. So uh, <coughs> so my name is uh, Zion and I'm from Singapore. So my website is Zion.ig. I'm a Zen certified engineer, both PHP and Zen framework. Uh, you want to find out more about me, just go to zion.sg. Okay, so some introduction. Um, now, when we design UI, user interfaces, we want it to be user-friendly or to have good UX, user experience. So how about application, how about API? API stands for Application Programming Interfaces. So basically, in short, is you call a URL with some uh, parameters and it returns you some response. So how about API? API should be user friendly, right? So in this case, who are the users of APIs? Developers. So first thing, this talk is focusing on API responses, not requests. API responses. Why? Because of the robustness principle, which says that be conservative in what you send, be liberal in what you accept. So basically, it means that when people, whatever people give you, you must accept. Yeah, then you try to massage it and uh, fit it to yourself. But when you send people stuff, you must be strict. Okay, make sure it conforms to a particular format. Okay, and don't deviate. And uh, there's also a security mantra that says never trust the user. So that's why I'm not talking about API requests. People can send you anything. People hackers can send you anything. So never trust the user. Always assume that whatever people send you will, will have some mistakes. So we can control. We cannot control what people give us, but we can control what we give back to others. So why this talk? So uh, currently, okay, I'm a, I forgot to mention that now. I'm a freelance web and mobile developer. So I do uh, JavaScript, I do front end, I do back end, I do DevOps, I do mobile. So like what Hook was saying, what uh, full stack, right? I don't know whether that qualifies, lah. Okay, um, I'm working for my current client for about a year already. So. Uh, at first, I was doing WordPress sites for them, how to mentor the offshore WordPress developers. Later on, uh, they took on a project with uh, Mindef and then I uh, to help them do mobile apps. So this talk is a result of me having a being on both sides. Previously, I was coding APIs, uh, a middleware APIs, uh, REST API in PHP for other people to consume. Now I on the other side, I consuming it. Okay, not using uh, not using uh, PHP or JavaScript or something that is uh, has loose types, but something using Java and Swift, which are strongly typed programming languages. Okay, how many of you have done uh, Java, C sharp, uh, Swift or TypeScript? Okay, TypeScript. Yeah, TypeScript. Okay. So some lingo before I start. JSON. Uh, JavaScript of object notation. It consists of name value pairs. Each pair is a property. Okay, it's a data interchange format. Okay, so for example, this is an example of a JSON uh, response. There are two properties: the name property <coughs> and the age property. Uh, for the age property, the name is age and the value is twenty. So an API consists of one or more endpoints. For example, let's say uh, NTUC. NTUC, let's say, has a REST API. So they have a product endpoint and a merchant endpoint. This I have to clarify because some people, uh, they will actually call it product API and merchant API, which is wrong. So your company, let's say NTUC, has one API, but it has many endpoints. Okay, uh, I have eight points. So this is about designing the responses for your API to make it friendly for developers. 
okay, so that everyone's life will be easier. So first thing, these are my suggestions that you can de defer about after the meetup. Lah. First one is camera case for names. So camera case, first letter, uh, first word starts with a small letter and subsequent word starts with a capital letter. So in this case, you see that, uh, let's say, let's say uh, okay, squeeze now, okay, never mind. So first you see that there are two properties, first name and the value is John. Uh, second property is uh, last name is name and value is though. So if I were to create a class, a Java class, okay, class person, I have two properties. So basically it will be uh, public dollar first name and public dollar last name. Actually this is PHP. Lah. Okay, let me see whether I, ah, very good. Okay, okay over here class person and I have a first name property and the last name property. So if I were to create a person, an instance of a person class and I pass in the JSON response above. So when I want to call the property, I'll just say my boss, arrow first name, my boss, arrow last name. Now let's look at snake case, snake underscore case. So in this case now the, uh, now the JSON response is here, the one in red. First underscore name is John, last underscore name is Do. And your person class, you name your properties accordingly. Okay? So that it's easier to map. Lah. So when you call, when you want to access the first name of the boss of the person instance, my boss, it is in camera case, but the properties is in camera uh, snake case. So in this case, there's this inconsistency. Uh, if you have a lot of this, so you find that eh, uh, my PHP variables uh, or my Java variables uh, are in camera case, then the properties or uh, subsequent properties uh, are in snake case. Seems a bit inconsistent. Okay. Now, another reason for advocating for camera case. Supposing, let's say, if you have a lot of properties, eliminating the underscore will kind of reduce the bandwidth. Lah. Okay, let's say, for example, you have a list of 1,000 people. If you elim eliminate 1,000 underscores, right, then that will save you about 1,000 bytes, I think. Lah, okay? So this is a lame reason, lah, but it's valid. Lah. Okay, now, WordPress. This is the WordPress table. Okay? So for WordPress, actually, they use underscore, which is fine. Which is fine. So uh, they have capital ID. And then they have post underscore author. So this is the database schema. The database columns are using underscore. So for WordPress, for the code, they are also mapping exactly straight to the database columns. So it makes life easier. Okay, so this is fine. In this case, WordPress don't agree with me, which is fine. They were found about 20 years ago, it's fine. The most important thing is be consistent. Okay, don't say, okay, my JSON response, I got one property is camera case, one property is snake case, one property is Pascal case, one property is kebab case. Uh, kebab case is because uh, it looks like this statistic uh, with this stick going through. So uh, it's called kebab case. Caps case and uh, some mix, whatever case that you have to think of. So most importantly is, you don't need to agree with me that to use camera case for names, okay? But the most important thing is to be consistent. Okay, second point. Use now only for objects, empty values for other data types. So the first block, PHP, dollar $s equals to 3, dollar $s equals to now, no problem. Now let's look at Swift. Swift is the programming language for iOS, okay? So now, um, if you put S, if you declare S as an integer, PHP, you don't need to declare type. They don't care. But Swift, you have to. Okay, if you declare S as an integer and you try to set it to now right or near right, it's not allowed. The compiler will stop you. It's not allowed. You want to do that? Yes, you can. You use something called optionals and put this question mark here. And then, yes, you can set it to now. So for simplicity, simplicity sake, right? Integer question mark is basically like a different type from integer. Just think of it this way, lah. Okay. Now, same simple. Like, why not I just use question mark? Use optionals for all the Swift uh, declarations. Fine, right? Not fine. Because when you use it, right, you need to unwrap the optional. So in this case, for example, if I put y as an optional integer, so integer question mark equals to three. When I need to use it, I need to put y exclamation mark. 
to extract out the value. I cannot put b equals to y plus 2. I must put b equals to y exclamation mark plus 2. Don't ask me why. Okay, so it's uh, quite messy. Now for Java. <coughs> Java very simple, right? Just put integer, right? Sure, can put now, right? Yes. Depends on which integer you use. If you use small little int, a equals to 1, you cannot set it to now. But if you use the integer class, capital int, e, g, r, right? Yes, you can set it to now. So, another two different case. <coughs> so, the problem is, in your JSON response, so normally, the application will consume it and then try to convert it to their own classes or their internal models. Okay, for Java and Swift, right? They say, okay, this class I have this property set as a as an integer ID, and to that integer cannot be now. Okay, can now, but very troublesome. Cannot be now. So when you return with your response, right? You either put s uh, s colon three or s colon zero. You don't put s colon now suddenly. <coughs> okay, um, an iOS app can be programmed in two programming languages, Objective-C and Swift. Now, supposing you are writing a library or a SDK for your client. So, for, for example, let's say Google Analytics SDK or Firebase SDK. So, people are going to use this SDK in Swift app and they are going to use the SDK in the Objective-C app. So, your SDK must be compatible with both languages. Now, so how to make it compatible with uh, Objective-C? Supposing if you were to write your SDK or your library or your framework in Swift. So for everything you want to expose or to make compatible with Objective-C, you put this annotation. Okay? Now, so to model this person, supposing I have this JSON over here, ID, tree, name, Bob, Address is a object, so it's an object, JSON object, and you have H now. Now, everything is fine. For Swift, for Objective-C, everything can be exposed. Integer, string question mark, uh, address question mark, uh, string, array of string, optional question mark, all this can be exposed to Objective-C, except for the last one, integer question mark. Because they say that, uh, you tell me the integer can be now, but I don't know how to cast it to the Objective-C NS number type. So I'm going to disallow it all together. So this makes it very troublesome. Supposing all these things, I can put name, now, it will work. I can put address, now, my program still won't crash. I can put this one as, hobbies as now. But once I put age or ID as now, right, the whole application will crash. So you need to write some code to handle it. <coughs> so when we say use now only for objects, empty values for what data types, we can take a leaf out of PHP book. So in PHP, for the empty function, the following values are considered to be empty. Empty string, two quotation marks. Zero, 0, 0 for float, now for objects, false for boolean, uh, the open square bracket and close bracket for empty array. Now, what happens if you cannot use zero? Uh, we want to say, let's say, uh, uh, unlimited, no limit on the number of records per page. Or let's say, uh, there's no duration. Supposing, let's say, I'm streaming videos. This is a JSON response on the video metadata. And I say that this video is a live stream, so there's no duration. So I cannot put zero, right? Zero means there's nothing, right? So. Uh, one suggestion is I can put minus one instead. So supposing, let's say, if I have pagination, I have unlimited records per page, I can put minus one instead of zero. And supposing, let's say, I don't know the age of the person, or the person did not fill it in. When I return it, instead of zero, I can return minus one. So this is point number two. In your JSON, use now only for objects. For primitive data types, it's a, if your property is, let's say, name, and it is a string, right? So if there's no value for the name property, use an empty string. Another reason for this is, for PHP, you only have the same method for checking whether it's now or empty. Empty means empty string, or empty string or zero. Huh? So you can put, if exclamation mark, if not dollar $s, so empty or non-empty. But for Java, 
you need to check first. If you declare s as a string type, okay, if it is not now, you can say s dot equals empty string. But if it is now, right, whole program will crash. So you need to check if s equals to now or s dot equals to empty string. So two checks just to check whether the string has some significant value. For Swift, same thing. You need to check whether it's equals to empty string and whether it's equals to near. It's two different values. Okay. Number three, point number three, consistent data types. Okay. Most important, as I said during the first point, right? The most important thing is consistency. So, for example, if I... What is the problem with this? The problem with this is ID here is a number. But over here, ID here is a string. Inconsistent. For PHP, no problem. Okay, that's why I love PHP. S equals to 1, S equals to hello, no problem. Okay, no errors. But if you try to do that in Java, you declare it as an integer and you set it to 1, suddenly you say S equals to hello, compiler will not get let you through. Same thing for Swift. If you declare it as an integer and suddenly you set it to a string, it's not allowed. Compiler will stop you. Okay, so consistent data types. If the property is an integer, for example, ID, keep it as an integer throughout all the objects and throughout all the endpoints. Sometimes, because your development team is probably uh, split into many development teams, so some people do this endpoint, some people do this endpoint, right? There's no overseer, no team lead to oversee the whole thing, right? Then they came up, each one comes out with their own standards. I use ID as an integer, I use ID as a string. So this is where the team link okay, comes into play. Now, if it is meant to be an array, okay, keep it as an array throughout. So for example, in this case, children is a list of children, a list of children. So there are two, two objects here, two children. The first object, the first child, ID 1, H3. The second child, the second object is ID 2, H5. Now, some people will do this. I've come across this as like I'm complaining this here. Hey, there's only one child. La, so I just change it straight to the object. La. See, la, this is a curly brace. La. These three are all JSON. La. This is a square bracket. That means it is an array. Okay, let me see. La. Okay, this is a square bracket. Okay, which is uh, a list. This is a curly brace, which is an JSON object. Okay? So if there's only one child, you still keep it as a list. It's just that you just throw away this one. Uh. So in this case, this should be you'll be children, square bracket, then curly bracket, ID1, H3, close curly bracket. Even if the array has only one element, still keep it as a array. Don't suddenly change it to an JSON object. And if it's empty, don't set to now. Okay? Set it to an empty array. So, consistent data types. Okay, let me see, huh? what's this? Ah, this is very interesting. Uh, I came across this uh, recently, so I added it to my slides. Uh, sometimes you have to be careful, no? So what happens is, uh, supposing I have a product endpoint, and then I have a per underscore page, which is 10. The example I came across in real life uh, is, when you append a query string parameter, question mark per page equals 10, right? Suddenly this one changes to the string. I was, I was coding my mobile screen. Hey, how can I keep crashing? Huh? You didn't crash before, eh? Then I that, check, check, I think for one full day, then I found out this was the issue. So the people doing the REST API using Laravel, so like what can't see just now, right? Separation of concerns, all these things, right? It has nothing to do with framework. It's all to do with the desire, the developer. So if the developer is not careful, right, this thing will happen. So when they actually return a response, they did not explicitly cast the fear to an integer. They say, okay, I'll just use whatever value is from the request string. Lah. Okay. So in this case, what happened was, sometimes it's integer, sometimes it's string for the same endpoint, just because the query parameters change. Okay, point number four. How you through it, yeah? Okay, use strings for ID. Now, the range for sign 64 bit integer uh, is minus uh, 9 quintillion to 9 quintillion. 
Okay, if you use unsigned, that means uh, you don't need negative numbers, it's 0 to 18 quintillion. Uh, quintillion means billion, billion, uh, 18 zeros. Now, if you use the Facebook graph API, you will notice that when they return you the response, the IDs are all strings. They don't use integer. Okay, this is probably because the number of Facebook posts in, the, in this whole wide world right, has already exceeded this value already. Okay, so they use strings. So, probably you are not as big as Facebook, but the thing is, supposing one day, right, uh, I don't want to use uh, running integer for my video IDs. I want to use some funny UUID, right, or some format uh, uh, for my UID, right. Hey, let's just change that. Uh, very easy, right, PHP, just change that. Uh, then the Java, the Android, or the iOS developer consuming API will cry. Now, when they... Supposing you are the REST API developer, change very fast, five minutes. I run my unit test, probably one minute. But how about the SDK? SDK, the iOS or the Android developer, first they need to modify the SDK, then they pass it to their clients, and then the clients will try to update the apps. When was the last time you update your Candy Crush or your Facebook app? Not straight away, right? So that means they need to keep their API, their version, as long as someone is still using the old version. So normally, you, it may be three months or six months before someone actually update the apps on their phone. So the turnaround time for them is very slow. So try to keep your data types, try to design it so that you won't change the data type so fast. Now, point number five, do not omit properties in your JSON response. Now in this case, there are two. Uh, at least as children, so that's a children property. But bot has no children, so the developer said, ah, never mind, just skip, la. so say bandwidth, right? So now, uh, the developer consuming this response have to ensure that no crashes happen when it comes here. Okay, they don't say, uh, we always assume that children property is there, and then suddenly your JSON response don't have, right? And then your whole application crashes. Now, this is in Swift for iOS. This, just because the children sometimes have, sometimes don't have, right? So I need to write all this whole chunk of code just to cater for it. Now, children, the number of children in this case is the integer. Just now I shared for a Swift SDK to expose integer to Objective-C, okay? Can, but integer question mark, optional integer cannot. Now, in this case, if the name is now, this will still run because it's name optional string equals now so suppose your json response the name property has a value of now this is still okay but if you omit the prop or even if you omit the name property they will just set it to a default now but if you omit the property for children okay you'll crash because this is not optional integer and i cannot use optional integer because it cannot be exposed to objective c so you think, right, how can Apple release Swift, but we are still so relying on Objective-C, right? Don't ask me. So in this case, long story short, when, they, when the developer receives a JSON response, he will just use the JSON decoder and pass in the class signature, person class, person class, and try to convert the whole JSON response, the string, into an instance of a person class. Long story short, if the children property is always there, whether you have children or don't children, right? This whole chunk of code required public init. This whole chunk of code can be omitted. And this is only how many? Four properties. Imagine I have 10 properties in person class. Oh, I cry. Because you need to do all this work. Okay? Point number six. Same top level properties across all endpoints. Now, when uh, you consume <coughs> when you consume an API, it is common to write some classes to model the response. So, for, for example, I have a person endpoint. <coughs> so, I have a person class to model the response, the, the result from the person endpoint. You are consuming the JSON string, the JSON response for the API, and then you cast it into a person object. So, <coughs> over here, I have two endpoints. Person endpoint, this is the sample response. Status, ID, name, address. So address is a object over here. I have a products endpoint. So in this case, status, I have a list of products. 
I have some pagination properties, page and total. Okay. Now, usually for iOS and Android, they normally have third-party libraries. You can make it make decoding easier. Just take the whole JSON string from the response and then you pass it to the method and then you say which class I want to model and you pass it accordingly. Now, so for example, in iOS for Swift, person response. So this is to model the response from the person endpoint, status, ID, name, and address. Person, this is to model a person. You notice that I don't have person here. All these fields correlate directly to the fields here. Status, ID, name, and address. Status, ID, name, and address. So address, I can put it as a, another class. So address is an object. So address it has its own class, street and zip. Similarly, for the product endpoint as status, a list of products, records per page, page total, and the product consists of ID and name. Now, supposing I have 1,000 endpoints. So I'm always using the same code to decode and then to convert the JSON into an object. I'm always using the same code. So in this case, right, what to do? But all the responses look so different, right? So Java and Swift, they actually have this thing called generics. So actually, uh, you can write a code as this. Handle a response. So T can be a person response or a product response. So when you call it, you say, uh, I'm using this code for person endpoint. I'm using this code for product endpoint. So this is actually how you will call it. Call it. This is a response handler. And I'll say response and I pass in a person response class. So I'll be using this code. Okay, using this code to create a person object. Okay, so this is the response handler and I pass it to handle response. Handle response takes in a completion handler, which is a, takes in the response type and a T. T can be person response or product response. Now Supposing you have 100 endpoints with 100 different top level properties. So you are doing this product response, product, person response, product, person, uh, person response, person address, then product response, product, then uh, merchant response, then merchant, then supposing 100 classes, okay, tau tiao, okay, your head will burst. So now I'm going to suggest to have the same top level, just the top level properties across all the endpoints. So, data, error, and pagination. Data, error, and pagination will always be objects. If there's nothing for them, you will use now. Remember I say, if it's object and there's nothing for the object, use now. So, data, error, and pagination. Now, a suggested error response. Error, right? So, there's no data. So, data I set to now. Error is object. Okay, I can put message person not found. Why I put it as object? Because later on I can put my internal error code. Uh, I can put some other exception or stat trace. Okay, so I keep it as object so that I can put in new properties. If I just put it as an error, as a string, next time if I want to squeeze in more error metadata, right, then the poor Java and Swift developer, they need to rewrite the SDK, submit to the client, put in their mobile app, then the client need to submit the mobile app to the app store and wait for three months and hope for what will be the Apple will approve the app and then wait for another six months for the end users to update the app. So now there's no pagination. So set it as now. How about the person endpoint? Notice that I threw away the status property because Developers must learn how to read HTTP response codes and not depend on the status key. You know, nowadays a lot of, uh, I see a lot of REST API, right? They always have, in the response, they have a status key. Status success. Is success uh, is a standard? No. Because what if the person spell as capital S and then what if a person uh, spell in all caps? What if the person, what if the developer say status okay? There is no standard list of answers for the status key okay and it's very prone to misspelling and miscapitalization so when the api returns you the response you normally return you with a status code 403 forbidden 200 okay uh, 500 server error developers must learn how to read that and not depend on the status key so now 
if I have a person endpoint, the data, so all the previous data in my person endpoint over here, say uh, ID, name, address. Okay, ID, name, address. Is there any error? Don't have, so I put now. Is there any pagination? Nothing, so I put now. So in this case, it's done. Next one, suggested response for a products endpoint. It's returning a list of products. Now look carefully. Okay, data is still an object. Just because I'm returning a list of products, data doesn't suddenly turn into a array or list. So data is still an object. So previously, I have products, so I just put products key and it's a list of products I put here. Any error? No error. Any pagination? Yes. So this is where I put my pagination information. Your actual data should be separate from your pagination. Uh, who cares if your products has only 10 products in this? I don't care. So these are called meta, meta, meta data. Should be separate. So that's why I put it inside pagination. If you find it's too long, right, you can just call it meta. La. So records per page, page, and total number of records. So put under the pagination key. So only three top level. So now I can have a response class that just have data, error, and pagination as objects. I don't have a person response class, uh, and then a products response class, and then a merchant response class. Don't have. I only have one type of response class, which is data, error, and pagination. So this makes life much easier for the consumer. Seven, second last one, eight. second last one, second, last one. Consistent naming properties for cross all endpoints. So a picture paints a thousand words. So the easiest way is actually to look at this very bad example. So supposing I have a response for an employee endpoint. Uh, the last name is Wo. Then for the spouse, right, uh, they use family name, which means the same thing. And instead of ID, you use person ID. And instead of age, you use years. Then from the manager endpoint, instead of ID, you use employee ID. And then instead of uh, last name, they use surname. And then instead of years and age, they use how old. So inconsistency. Okay? Consistent in me. It makes life much easier. Okay? People do not need to waste time. Hey, so this is, uh, what is last name? Uh, what is family name? Uh? No need. Okay? Everyone just use last name. Uh, sometimes ID... Sometimes person ID, if products are endpoint, will be products ID, then manager will be manager ID. Very confusing. Just ID. Consistent naming. And this is our last point. Congratulations. Okay. Use UTC time zone and ISO, ISO 8601 for timestamps. So just a very quick question. This piece of PHP code in yellow color, highlighted in yellow color. Okay. What would this produce on National Day? So National Day, uh, Singapore is uh, 9 of August. So last year was 9 of August 2018. So how many of you say that when I run this at midnight on National Day, will produce answer number one? Hands up. Now, answer number two. Hands up. Answer number three. Okay, very good. Okay, so actually it depends. If I run it on my laptop, this very nice old 2015 MacBook, right? If I run it on my laptop over here, right? The answer will be two. Because on my laptop, my PHP is set to Singapore time zone. If I run it on my previous company's... No. Hey, bro, sorry. If I run it so on this laptop, it will be UTC time. If I run it on my previous company's server, right? It will give Singapore time. Okay? It depends. Uh, usually, you think, right? Best practice. When I set up a server on uh, Google Cloud or Azure or AWS, right? EC2 instance, I'll just put the time zone. The time zone is definitely UTC, right? Wrong. It depends on who is setting it up. So, uh, so previously, right, my system administrator say I'm the one looking at all the system logs all the time, right? So, and I'm sitting here, down here in Singapore, right? So, it makes sense that I should set the server time zone in a Singapore time zone, right? So, when I look at all the logs, right, it's all in Singapore time. Then I can easily trace out when did this happen. Correct or not? Correct. So do not assume, do not assume that the server time zone is always set to UTC. 
Okay, so when you code in your PHP application, right, you must always explicitly set the time zone. You cannot take chances. You say, hey, no mind, I just call date C, right, and then uh, assume that it's UTC, no. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, the dates will root, uh, read differently if you are in the US or in, in UK. Okay, in uh, US, month, day, year. Over here in Singapore and UK is day, month, year. So this is ambiguous. You don't know which is which. So the suggestion is to use ISO 8601. ISO 8601 is a standard. So four digit year, two digit month, two digit day, T, uh, T and then hour, minute and second and the time zone. Always with the time zone. Now if you use date C, over here, they see. If your server time zone is Singapore, this will be the answer, the first one. If your server time zone is set to UTC, the answer will be this. So, still, uh, you still have a problem. So, the recommendation, recommendation is use GM date. So, GM date is always in UTC or GMT. Now, supposing if you are using the date time class, okay, and you want to set the time zone right, this is how you can do it. New date time zone. Now you notice that I don't use C, okay? Because over here I want to have a, the microseconds as well, okay? So I have a different format. So in this case, this is the actual format of uh, ISO 8601. Four digit year, two digit month, two digit day, T, 24 hour, uh, minute, second, and then the time zone. <coughs> now uh, I had the uh, Okay, let me see. Okay, I had a, sometimes it's also good to put the timestamp in the request header. Now my whole thought is about API responses, right? But when doing API requests, sometimes it's good to also put the timestamp, the request timestamp explicitly. Because I say when I call from my uh, mobile phone, right, the app, right, so I, I can actually know the time zone that the phone is in. I had a situation where <coughs> we had a client uh, overseas. So actually, he was in Singapore. Then we found that how come his uh, app, right, his mobile app, our mobile app, right, always run into server authentication errors. So we keep debugging, debugging, and then finally we found out that his phone is always one hour behind our server time. And the client is from Indonesia. So basically, clear enough, right, his phone is set to... In the Indonesia time zone, whereas our server is running in Singapore time zone, so it's always one hour difference, and we didn't know that unless until we did some uh, deep debugging. So in this case, if the mobile app had appended the time zone, okay, appended the time zone and the request timestamp right in the API request, right, we'll know, okay, because or else actually we all know the API request need to explicitly send in the time zone. This sort of information need to be done by the, the mobile app. So ISO 8601 in, including the time zone. Now, then some people say, Nema Zion, why not just use uh, units time stamp? Very simple, right? It's always an integer, right? This is how many digits, I also forget it. Just use this, uh, very fun, right? Now, wait, yeah. Okay, correct. Okay, wait and say, uh, there's a limit. Okay, uh, 2031, right? Uh, the year 2031, we have, uh, uh, we have this unit timestamp bar also. Now, the problem is, when you come in first thing in the office, right, and then there's fire to be fought. There's, we are always fighting fire. And then you're looking through the logs, right? When did this happen? When did this happen, right? You compare this with this. Which one is easier to debug? Which one is easier to troubleshoot? The manager is breathing down your net. So when did this happen? Then you're looking through all the access logs. You're looking through all the API requests. And then you find that, uh, wait, uh, wait, uh. sir, I go to this website. I go to units, epoch, time converter. I copy and paste this. Paste it. Oh, actually, this is uh, 21st of September, 6 p.m. Then the next one, uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. I copy this one and then paste it. Uh, no. So I know that we should save bandwidth. Like just now, I talked about the underscore, right? But... Uh, usually, I will recommend that for timestamp fields, right, you use AC01 with time zone. With time zone. Now, why with time zone? 
that's because if you don't put, you don't know. Okay, one developer may think, oh, uh, I right now here in India, what's the, what's the India time zone? Plus five hours and 30 minutes. It's not a whole number. Uh. Even Singapore has had six different time zones. Time zone is a political thing. Okay, it has nothing to do with a geographical location. It's a political thing. So you cannot assume that, oh, this time zone uh, definitely is UTC time, time zone. No. In my previous company, right, when they send the JSON responses, right, all these time stamps, uh, all these time stamps were always in Singapore time. Do know, right? So supposing you have a remote developer in US, so he assumes that it's US time zone. Then all your application will be passing it only. The the principle is when you store in your database, when you handle it in your application, when you pass it in your JSON response, all your timestamps should always be in UTC. Only at the last mile when you show it to a user, right? When you show it to the user on the browser or in the mobile app, then you convert it to the user's and user's time zone. Or else internally everything should be using UTC time zone. But to make it more clear, okay, always specify the time zone. Now, so the last point, last slide, I think, yeah. So the gist of all the, point, all the points is KISS. Keep it simple and stupid. So stupid, so simple that you don't need to waste time thinking about it. Now, you don't need to agree with me on all the points, okay? But just remember one point. If you cannot remember any of the eight points, right, just remember one point, consistency. Make sure that your API has consistency throughout all the endpoints and all the responses. This picture, have you, anyone know of this story? The fraud in the well. So the fraud in the well, uh, he thought, wow, my wood is very big. I can see the sky, the, the sun, and the cloud. Right? Until one day, got one turtle, right? Come by, right? Then he said, oh, my wood is very big, right? Then the turtle said, no, like, I'm going to a big sea. You know, it's, even, it's an even bigger world. So the point of this is, uh, previously, I was just a plain PHP developer. Just doing my own PHP REST API, everything. I don't know all this. Until I became a mobile developer. And then I realized the pain points. So actually, sometimes uh, it's not so good to actually just focus on one programming language. Sometimes you need to touch a bit on the other programming languages to see uh, what they have and then pick the best points and also so that you can work better with your other colleagues. So with this, that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much.